All right, hey, this is Orrin Claff. I'm back here with a done deal. As many of you who know me uh, understand, I am a weak person. I mean, I'm of a strong mind. That's why I learned to talk my way out of circumstances. But I, I couldn't get in a fight and survive very long. I'm small in stature. And uh, I mean, I can lift heavy objects, but I couldn't really. So I, I gravitate to people who know how, have situational awareness and know how to, uh, how to defend themselves, both psychologically but physically as well. And I want to introduce Simon Trezelian. Simon has an incredibly interesting background uh, in both the military and in psychological uh, offense and defense. And he, like me, has to get, and, and in many times his career has been inserted into situations, has to recruit somebody to his way of thinking very quickly and then make a relationship out of that recruitment. So with that intro, where do we go from here? A little bit of background on yourself, sure. and let's talk about psychological offense and defense. Okay, cool. Well, my, I've got a fairly colorful background. My background is military special forces and undercover covert ops. I spent 16 years in the field. Uh, my job was to go into areas of interest, find out who the bad boys were, get alongside them, and then recruit them to work as agents for me, feed them back into the terrorist group or the spy ring, and then run them until we decided to uh, retire them. So I did that for 16 years, say, coming away with only one bullet wound, one knife scar, one broken bones. I was pretty good at what I did. And I think when the stakes are that high, when coming second means something very different and losing a market share or a deal, you tend to get pretty good at what you do. So this, this is exact. by the way, uh, Simon's been talking for 30 seconds and I have a million questions. Right. <laughs> so hopefully this is not a 45 hour interview, but if we can keep you here as long as we can. So, so recruitment is a huge issue. Yep. High stakes, as I view it the same way, is, you know, in business, we, there's, there's, low stakes environments where you know you might lose a deal but you live to fight another day but when you're raising money or there's a joint venture sure. you know that that's why I'm so interested in your topic is when the stakes are high you know what's the different level of game than when oh, you, you, so, mean, it's, it's yes. huge see the, th the thing is is that um, having knowledge pre-knowledge you know forewarned is forearmed and in any deal, you need to get as much information as possible to allow you to have the greatest amount of response. So intelligence will only get you so far. Uh, and certainly in the military, you know, we had electronic intelligence, we had satellites in the sky, we had political intelligence. But what we found is that there was nothing quite like human intelligence with actually being next to someone who actually knows what the hell is going on. Uh, and therefore, Hugh Mint became very, very strong in the 70s all the way through to, to current day. There is nothing like speaking to an agent who is actually inserted into the area who knows exactly what the plot is. And to be able to elicit that information coherently, effectively, and then to be able to collate it and leverage it. That is the key. So recruitment is about intelligence leverage. Yep. So, so let me pull the e-brake for a second, and let's go into some of your background, because sure. I heard some of it before, it's fascinating. I wish I was you, I shouldn't say that on camera, you know, I should be happy with myself, and maybe I need to go into counseling, but, you know, <laughs> after hearing the story that you're telling, I'm like, wow, I wish I was Simon, or should we say Simon, right? Okay, uh, you know, when you have these undercover guys, you never know what exactly their right. name is. But uh, tell us, uh, yeah, a little bit about some of the, uh, how you got into this field, what military you were in, and, and bring us into that world so we can sure. have a little perspective on the things well, that you're saying. Well, I, I think I can track it back to being in martial arts at 13 years old. Um, I, I was like you at that point, you know, I, was, I, I wasn't a big guy, I wasn't an aggressive guy, I'd never got involved in gangs, never got involved in violence. And then I started karate and that changed my life, it changed my viewpoint. I became a, a warrior, a, a mindset warrior. You know, I had to get on my bike three times a week ride seven miles to the dojo, three hours, you know, three hour session, seven miles back. I did that for three times a week for three years. So by the time I got to the military, my mindset was at, at such, I did not know when to stop. So special forces was actually a really good fit for me um, because physically I, I had that ability, but most importantly, mentally and emotionally, I knew that I could overcome any challenge that was given to me. So. Once I got into that and, and realized that 
there was, uh, was always one more thing to do, one more thing to do. And I knew that providing I had the mindset to do it, I would accomplish that. And I've used that as a, as a framework for everything that I do now, everything. So what are the, some of the requirements that are put on you in military life from an intelligence standpoint that aren't in civilian life? Just, just to clear some lines of delineation. Right. Well, right. I, I liken it to a recipe. Any time that you can actually get a recipe that works and you replicate it, you get the same outcome every time. And, and I like that. I like to know that what I'm doing is going to give me the outcome I desire. So my recipe of this is to, to get yourself into the, the, the best, most powerful, or most appropriate state. Now, in that state, and only in that state, do you operate. So can you imagine being in a, in a helicopter with eight other guys and one of them going, oh God, I hope we're not going to die. Right. You know, it's not a state that you want to be in. So we had to be in a, the most powerful state or the most appropriate state. So but therefore just you have the, to gauge didn't just that. Didn't fear put you in that state? Yeah. Not to be a... Uh, fear um, is awesome. Right, not to say, hey, uh, what you did is easy, but if I'm an eighth guy in a helicopter and I know I have a job to go do and I, I've sort of, it's not like I'm going on film you know, I'm bigger than my problems. I'm bigger yeah. than my problems. I'm bigger than my problems. Like, I have real problems. You know, I'm about to bail out of a helicopter into Sarajevo, you know, and take incoming. It sort of, it makes you bigger than sure. your problems. Is there, is courage, see, courage yeah. is not the absence of fear. Courage is the ability for you to, to use that fear into such a powerful way that it becomes irrelevant. So how do, we, how do we take from your experience of, and I cut off your story, uh, so go back to the helicopter with eight guys, because that's yeah. more interesting than what I was about to say. <laughs> All right. Well, I was saying, see, everyone knows that. Everyone's, everyone knows that you're going into an area, and we were never the biggest unit in there. Yeah? And this is what I believe is very, very powerful to know, is uh, once you get into this, this, this thing called a force multiplier, it means that because of the quality of our selection, the quality of our training, the quality of our character, the quality of our support elements as well, and the quality of our planning and execution, we were worth more than the opposition. So we didn't mind that we were going in there as a four-man team or an eight-man team, because we were worth 50 to 100 to 200 of the opposition. So that is the power of selection. And this is why you know, we, I make no apologies for it. I've worked in an elitist organizations forever. I cannot see the point in working with people at a very low level. It doesn't work. So when you start to maximize who you are, you automatically attract, almost like for this law of resonance, you put out this, this vibration that attracts to you like-minded people. And that's pretty much how we met. So once you can get to that situation, you become different to anyone else. You can attract in, um, people, you can attract circumstances. And once you're in that state, and only in that state, you then begin to adopt the correct, most powerful, or most appropriate strategy. Now, strategy without state means nothing. So, not many people know what the word strategy actually means. It's actually a Greek word from stratego. And it literally means, a lot of people say, well, it's a plan, it's a... Well, for me, strategy action. means I wake up, get a cup of coffee, and show up at work, and see what is coming at me. And that works for right. you. <laughs> But the actual <laughs> word strategy <laughs> itself literally means the ability to yeah. engage an opponent at a time and place of your choosing. So in military doctrine, the commander that is able to determine the time and the manner and the location of the conflict will invariably win that conflict, which is very powerful when you adopt that with negotiations, when you adopt that with sales pitches and things like this. So now you've got your state, now you've got your strategy, and then you apply the correct, most appropriate or most powerful skills. So it's this recipe of great state, great strategy, great skills inevitably leads to great success. So walk us through a real world example, because I've heard some of them, they're so, so interesting. Not to prove that you have examples, but because your examples are great. So I got deployed as Simon, I hit the ground, there's somebody I had to recruit, I went and got them, uh, I got in state, I had a strategy, I recruited them for my purpose and I ran them. Okay. Well, I mean, I can tell you a story which doesn't actually get anyone into any trouble. Um, certain area we had identified a terrorist commander that we wanted to get along by certain area you don't mean kansas 
Definitely, we're not in Kansas now, Dorothy. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so no, not Kansas. <laughs> right. uh, and basically, we'd done our research. We got our intelligence. You know, we'd uh, we'd intercepted his mail. We'd intercepted his phone calls. We knew everything about this guy. You know, we knew how much money he had in the bank account. We knew his friends. We knew his relationships. We knew his weaknesses. We knew his strengths. So we decided, you know, the thing with agent handling, you've got to have access, you've got to know what they know. You've actually got to have point of contact, you've got to know where they're going to be at any one time, and you've got to have motivation. Now the motivation is the key element here. Motivation is a mix of two Greek words. Asian, which means to have the experience of, motive, the reason. So when you're looking at motivation, it's like, what is their reason to take action that is going to benefit you? Yeah? So um, he had a new car. I drove into the new car, literally at a petrol pump, bang, straight into the back of the new car. Guess what happens when you actually have a car accident? You've got to swap details, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I was, <laughs> I, was, I, was in, I was in Beverly Hills, real quick, I was coming over the hill, I was behind Morgan Freeman. I called Michael, who works here, this was almost 10 years ago. I go, oh my God, Morgan Freeman's in front of me, he's in a Rolls Royce, the top is down, he's in a Camarillo, this is so cool. He goes, you want to meet him? I go, I'd love to meet him. He goes, run into him. <laughs> Exactly, see, you've done the same thing, you yeah? know? High stakes. Yeah. So, so literally, yeah. bang, into the car, guy's furious, comes out, threatens me with all sorts. Yeah. Hey, you yeah, know, conciliatory. Look, I'm not insured, not sure how it's going to run. Look, I really don't want this to go any further. Give me your details. Look, you know, swap details. Two days later, met up with him, gave him a package of money. Guess what? We had people filming it. So he's now taking money from an intelligence officer. Yeah. Guess what? That's called leverage. Yeah. So the rest was history. Um, guy worked for us. We yeah, gave him the, uh, the option to work for a large and powerful organization that worked within the law to save lives, save all this type of thing. Worked on his motivations as well, sure. had a young family. And, and it worked. And that was part and parcel of the peace process. So, so I think what we just heard there is a, a description of a classic recruitment. Yeah. Right? Identify, in, uh, um, close distance, engage, get leverage, use the leverage. We had our build. strategy, but can you imagine if I'd have done that and gone, uh, uh, right. uh, and not been in the right state? Yeah. So I was in there, but I chose my state. I didn't want to go there blustery and bullish. Yeah. I can do that. But I went there conciliatory because I wanted him to feel he had the upper hand. I initiated that. I was in charge. And I utilized the skills of persuasion, the skills of influence, to be able to leverage his weak spots, to be able to enhance his position of perceived power. But the reality was, I owned him. So That is the power. My view is, sir, you can't own people forever. And, no. and so this is, this is a, and we talked a little bit before, this is short form game. Right? This is how to bring somebody into your world, raise your status, lower theirs, have them want to do business with you, whether it's leverage, you know, in the way you described it, or, or legal, uh, you know, business leverage. Uh, and that's all short form game. It's hard to sustain over days, weeks, months, and certainly but that, years. But that's it brings people into the relationship, yeah. but then you form the relationship with them. Right? And you don't need to bring leverage every day, but this is the short-form game to convert them into long-form game. Yeah. So run me through your thoughts on sort of the difference between short-form recru recruitment and long-form relationship. It all comes down to outcome at the end of the day. What is the desired outcome? And what are you prepared to give in order to what have you prepared to receive? Now, I believe that people are motivated by one thing, one thing only, and it doesn't matter whether it's whether you buy something, you sell something, whether you want to create a relationship, long-term or short-term, we do things for one thing and one thing only, and that is to feel better. So what is gonna make this person feel better right now, right here, you know? We're finding this with millennials. You know, they need instant gratification. You know, they've got instant communication. Yeah. They could actually get on their phone and find me in an instant and know everything about me. Before, you know, in the 80s, you had to go to a library to do that. You had to and, do all and, sorts and of things. And by the way, if you, if you ever get to be in a room with Simon, the one thing that will make you feel better is to be further away from him. He oh, is a strong, <laughs> intimidating, uh, uh, a fully present person that uh, has, has a lot of strength. No, but, uh, all, you know, all kidding aside, I mean, yeah, so people can get that instantaneous gratification yeah. and they want to feel better constantly. So, so you've got to know 
enough information about the person, but then you've got to get in, and we're literally within 10 minutes. It's interesting that you made that distinction of me, because I can utilize that presence to get an immediate effect, immediate. So now people are interested. So you've got to get their attention. Yeah. But now you've got their attention, what do you do with that? Okay, because otherwise, all you are is just a picture. So you've got to go in there very, very quickly, and none of this, you know, sort of fluffy rapport building, how are you today, no one cares. No one really you know, wants to know that. So you've got to earn the right. They've got to know that they're not going to waste the next 15 minutes of their life by talking to you. So what do you do? What are you passionate about? What can you do for them? Straight off the bat. You so know? this is so exciting for me because I've talked to you know, tens of people, hundreds of people, thousands of people, and, and everybody's about that slow approach, build rapport, take no risk. I mean, this is, I mean, and this is why I'm so interested in this relationship I have with Simon, um, relationship with Simon. Um, <laughs> but because we come from two totally different worlds, and I mean, you're in business, I want to talk about your business, but I have come to this conclusion as well. Nobody has time for the fluff. It's a waste of time. Get somebody's attention. Once you have it, use it. Yeah. Use it to show them what you can do for them in the clearest way possible, right? And then build trust and status, and that is short form game, and then convert that into a long term relationship. Yeah. And long term relationships, you can screw up a lot, yeah. right? But in the short term relationship, you, you bump into somebody's car, you need to exchange information, get some money, changing hands, whatever. That's very programmatic and it's nuanced. You screw up one thing, look in the wrong direction, have some of your team um, sort of reveal themselves, you, you code yourself out as an officer, you know, or, or whatever. In the short form game, people are hyper vigilant and they're looking for that mm. stuff. In the long form relationship game, you can screw up you know, 10, 20, 30 times. Yeah, and still, you can make it better. Still, you can make you can it better and everything. This type of thing. So it's just so. Well, look what we did. O- look me. what we did over coffee. Yeah. yeah. We had 15 minutes over over coffee. I was able to hit you straight away with presence, which you remembered because that's what you've just been talking about. Yeah. I was able to earn the right, but then I went straight into what about you? Okay. Tell me about you. What are your needs? What are your desires? So now you're quite happy to talk about yourself. You yeah. give me all of the ammunition because I've got the skills then to better turn that round and leverage your desires. So it's not about me anymore. So okay? let's, let's talk your desires. about that. Most of the time when people want information about me, it's boring. What I experience with you is I don't remember getting questioned. And I know your background is as an interrogator. And I didn't feel, matter of fact, almost every other sit down coffee meeting I've had meeting somebody, I felt interrogated. When I sat down with the interrogator, I don't remember a single question. What, what happened? You know, so, so when people go, where did you come from? What did you do? What was your first business deal? Why did you write the book? Um, why do you spell your name with an O and not a three? Um, <laughs> why, do you, you know, why do you live here and not there? You know, it's like, crap, I, I'm, I want to have a conversation, not be interrogated. But when I sat down with you, I just felt like we had a conversation. What's the difference? What are the skills that you applied? How did you make me feel that way? Okay. Well, right. well first of all, you felt at ease. And, and that is because people feel at ease when, they're in the, it, when the, it, they are in the, a relationship with strength. You know, yeah. they feel good. They, yeah. they feel that I'm not yeah. shifty. But also, if you notice, I, I, I always, always go with 45 degrees. I became very eye contact with you. Um, you know, we had the, sh- the shake and all this type of thing. That made you feel more comfortable with me. Yeah, you feel yeah. incredibly grounded. Like, yeah. like the things you say, I can take at face value, and they have an inherent truthfulness to them. So I think maybe that was step one. Is I but just fifteen yeah. minutes later, I knew yeah. everything about you. I knew yeah. that you just had a new baby boy, eighteen months old. You know, you, you got a, a lovely wife from Belize. You know, you told me about your business. You told me about certain deals that you've been been doing. I know about your motorbikes. I know about your cars. You're a bit of a petrol head. You've got all of these these. You're you're a real multifaceted person. So that gives me more leverage, because I can pick any one of those, you know? I saw your relationship with your child. That, yeah, is one of your massive strengths, also big weakness, yeah? So there's all of these different areas. So within that 15 minutes gave me enough ammunition to be able, you know, if I was looking at you as a, as a recruitment target or something like that, I know exactly how to position that now. You know, you're Great. very all much all my uh, KGB agent fans <laughs> are now going to be draining my bank account yeah, and have exactly to turn right. the Etch-a-Sketch over and do a reset. But, but no, why no didn't point. I feel the questions coming in 
and they just it just felt like the information was just flowing out of me, but I don't remember being interrogated. It's it's an elicitation process that, that I do. So when you know people ask structured questions, then the normal response is that you get defensive. Listen to that. Right? Yeah. I mean, if you're out there, listen to that. When you ask, just whatever you said, say it again so it sinks into people's minds. Because this is what we see. I see the biggest screw up. Right. It, and you, yeah. you know what happens is that people have a shopping list. And they practice that shopping list because they don't want to forget anything. They don't want to get back to the car and, and realize they haven't got the nappies that right. they went out there in the first place yeah. for. Yeah. But their brain gives it away. So when you're listening for that and go, is this person really interested in me or are they just going through a shopping list because they want to sell me something? So if that's the point and, and those red flags go up, I'm now defensive because I go, if I give this away, what am I giving away, you know? Man, and I how is he going to leverage that? I wish I was recording this. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, so this what I do, exciting. let me tell you what I do, the yeah. secret sauce yeah. is that I go into an emotional state yeah, remember, great state, most appropriate state, of being ultimately interested in what you are and how I can be of service to you. Because if I'm in service to you, that will automatically reflect back on me if you are a person of integrity. Yeah. Okay? So, so all I have to do is go, what is in the highest and the best for this relationship right now? And I allow my brain and my intelligence just to flow. So when you're in flow, there's no resistance. Yeah? yeah, it's only when you have structure that you have resistance. It's like a wall that you hit up against. So there are uh, no walls here. This is really interesting to me because there's from my book and the general perception that I put out there, maybe mistakenly, people do think I bomb in with a helicopter, say a couple of magic hypnotic words, take money from people, but you know, with some kind of magic pitch that goes through a laundry list and says certain silver bullet things. But I'm exactly so when I'm pitching somebody, I want them to be. I, I generally, I don't have, you know, I generally want them to be successful. I want them to buy our services. I want to go out them out there and help them make. It. Like I generally want them to be incredibly successful with us, together, through us, and make their life better. And I think that's what stops me from asking these questions. And just my motivation is desirous of creating great stuff for them. Yeah. And hearing you, I didn't really realize that in myself. I haven't written about it, but but in hearing you say that. I think it's true. I don't have a list of tactics that I go through. I really want people to make the most amount of money possible with us helping them. Yeah, and it's like, it's like anything with recipes. The best chefs don't know their recipes. Yeah. They just yeah. go yeah. with their gut yeah. because they're good at what they do. But you know the recipe because you have to think about this stuff because yeah. it's kind of life and death. And so yeah. you actually have to think about the sequence. But you, it's, 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 it's almost like this uh, unconscious you know, intelligence that, aspect that we have, is that the more that you do something, the better that you get it automatically. So you don't actually have to go you know, bullet points or from one to five, it becomes one. So the, my whole process is to make it eloquent, to make it so that people don't know what you're doing. It used to be that you used to ask yes questions, you know. So you, like me, wish to be better now, and you know, all this yeah, whole yeah. NLP type yeah, thing. Right. We went way beyond NLP years ago because people knew they were getting NLP'd on, you know? Right. So what we yeah. did right. is actually work it so it becomes such an eloquent flow of conversation. People can't differentiate between what is an order, what is an embedded command, what is a licitation of information, what is actually structural and leveraging you know, your motivation. People don't know what that is because it just seems like a conversation. You know, utilizing your tone, utilizing the body language. Even what I'm doing right now is about flow. And I can actually flow the voice and I can actually flow the, the body language so you feel good. So it's not about... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I was going to say, like, when I'm talking with my hands, I do feel like I'm karate chopping a little bit. And then, and I will... Yeah. But there's and, a time but, and a place for that. But when you're doing it, Take us inside your head. When you're doing it, it does feel more flowy and smooth. And w See, when I do it, I feel like I'm at yoga class. Namaste, right? And, and, uh, but when you're doing it, it has power and flow. So how am I screwing up my you know, body communication and you're making it feel so strong and flowing? Is well, it just in your DNA or is there, or is there some tr 
training. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's like martial arts. You get to yeah. a point where it becomes an automatic process. So if you notice even what I'm doing now, I'm just, I'm just holding that space, holding that energy. And when I wish, I'll just touch my heart and flow it to you. So I'm coming from the heart. So you, you don't lock that in because you don't go, oh, he's doing that now. Right. You right. just feel that I'm, I'm coming from a point of integrity, a point of authenticity and I truth. I do. I mean, you're not here. I, f like, I literally feel it. When he went like that, I, was, I feel like I'm in a video game and some kind of like health energy <laughs> hit me. Uh, uh, yeah, Simon from House Targaryen. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> dragons are flying around. You don't see them, but there's They're dragons. They're outside. It's flying. health yes. and safety issue, yes. you know? Yeah. <laughs> OSHA. OSHA doesn't <laughs> let the dragons in the building. But, um, what, you know, we take cameraman Josh, right? And we take him to some undisclosed country that we don't have good relations with. And we say, cameraman Josh, go recruit this Hezbollah uh, uh, party member, right? And we send him off. What would he screw up not having had training? Well, um, I mean, the chances are that you're probably going to end up dead, and that's why we don't allow cameraman Josh. Well, not to go Josh. Do these you things. could take cameraman Keenan, right? <laughs> if that's the and case. See, that, this is the whole point, and you see this with any any unit that has to work independently and where the stakes are high. You know, yeah. so when when a commander in chief goes to, to make a really high stakes move, they don't you know, ring up the, the commander of the army and go, who you got available today? Yeah. You know, they go for the highest and the best. And this is why the selection process of British SAS, um, US Navy SEALs, is so unapologetically high. You know, in my unit, we were, we were, um, we were recruited from the top 3% of the Army, Navy, Air Force and Marines. A hundred of us would actually get to this secret location and they said, guys and girls, five of you will pass in eight months' time. Take a look around and see who the other four are. And that's how we started off. We knew that there were 100 people there. We knew that it was only going to be down to five. In my unit, it was only four. So they were looking for things that we didn't even really know. Everyone could run. Everyone could fight. Everyone yeah. could shoot. That was, a, that was, a, a, you know, that was a, like the passing in aspect. But it was like, are you authentic? Are you honest? Can you actually overcome challenges you know, way beyond what normal people would do? Are you able to go through a pain barrier that other people are simply not prepared to do? So the selection process was very powerful. Then you get to the point of, can this person speak? Can they actually learn psychological assess? Can they actually see and scan a person's body language, micro expressions? Can they institute stressors into that? That's a nut. We lost a lot of people because they couldn't do that. We lost a lot of people because they couldn't write properly. You know, so you have to be able to report it. If you can't report all the information and intelligence you're gaining, it's redundant. So, Simon, where was the location of this secret training? I don't remember. I cannot answer that question. <laughs> I haven't learned enough from you yet. Um, so, uh, all right. But I'm, I am in middle America. Mm -hmm. I'm an entrepreneur. I've raised $250,000 to open a store, or restaurant, or work on my app. I'm not a Navy SEAL, you know, British SAS officer. And I don't, I'm not going to go into that kind of training. What, where are the parallels that I can draw? Now, right? th this, that's an excellent question yeah. because when I got out of the military, I went, who the hell is going to employ me? Right. Really? I mean, I was responsible for recruiting agents, defectors. You know, you don't get that in civilian life. What I was able to do is distillate and really break down the processes of what I actually did. Yeah. And, and therefore, I was able to put them into modules, if you like, yeah. so that people like you, people you know, that are high performance people that require a level that is way beyond books, way beyond you know, these cheap CD sets that people can do. And, and essentially, if you have the in inherent qualities and values, you can then have these skills bolted on. So you don't have to go through all the garbage that we had to go to to get selected to do that. You go straight to the horse's mouth. What can I utilize? You know, because if you can't use it and take it to the bank, it's a waste of time. So, so I'm a business guy in somewhere, Santa Fe, Wichita Falls, Buffalo, New York, New York City, San Francisco, California. You know, I'm out there. 
and I have started a business or I'm a sales guy in a, in a business and I'm trying to reach a new revenue level, right? right? But I, you know, I, I get dragged down in high friction. So I have customers that I'm trying to sell. I have customers that need customer service. Like my whole day is getting taken up and I'm starting to move forward in inches. I've sort of lost control of the dream. I think it's very common too. I find myself in it. We're getting three deals. We have three deals that are closed but still need record keeping. We're hiring new people. We're moving to a new location. It's like death by a thousand cuts, right? What, what, what can these kind of people and myself do through your experience to sort of get more control, get, get, get a breakthrough from the heavy weight of everyday stuff that we have right. to do? It just seems like 11.30 p.m. comes around faster than I can blink. And then yeah. I go, that's a day, checked off, I got a few things done. And I just feel like um, with you here, you're just so powerful and so organized in your mind and, and sort of know physiology and psychology so well. I'm interested in your perspective. Help me Okay. Out. Well, yeah. first of all, you've got to have what I call situation awareness. You've got to get a real clarity on what's going on. So yeah. it doesn't matter if you're in that's Wichita Falls or Buffalo or what, whatever. You could be selling paper clips. Yeah. You could be selling you know, high level insurance, whatever it does, it doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is, is that I've been around this world for so long that I know there is, there is not a company out there that has a uniquely desirable product, price pointed where everyone can afford it with no competition. Except for Apple. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they'll disagree. Yeah? So every, no matter who they are, there's gonna be competition trying to get your stuff, trying to get your turf, right. trying to grab totally your agree. customer. Totally agree. So the only way, it doesn't, see, your internet is not going to be faster than your competition's internet. Your ability to put ad advertisements on any media is not going to be any different. You know, your budgets may change, but essentially your technology is not going to change. Yeah? So there is only one variable, one variable, and that is the people. So if you recruit the best people, and if you haven't got people to recruit, you make you the best person because you're the only variable that your competition can't get. So, okay. not to put you on the spot, but there's anybody here you think we should get rid of? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they all seem pretty well selected. Oh, no, I didn't expect a politically <laughs> correct answer from you, but... Uh, I don't know them well enough yet. Write on a piece of paper and we'll take yeah, them out after. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so, so... So, going back to that then. So, once you get the situation awareness, you know that your success will depend entirely on your performance in relation to your competition. Yeah. Military doctrine, same as business doctrine, same as athletics, no difference. You could actually have uh, American football. Pitch is the same for everybody. The ball's the same for everyone. The same technology of helmets and pads. Well, I was going to use that, that example. I mean, the teams are so close now. I mean, yeah. they, they actually have to play all the games before you know who's yeah, going to win. Well, exactly. But you know, it used to be when we were growing up, you go, oh, Green Bay Packers going to win the Super Bowl. Yeah. I don't but want to bet against that. It comes down to the team, now, not the tactics. Yeah. Everyone's, got, yeah. everyone's got ideas about tactics. It comes down to, does your quarterback believe that he can actually make that throw? Does your runner believe that he can actually make that reception? If he actually does that, then it's going to work. So, if he doesn't believe it, it's never going to work. So, I mean, it's so easy to say everybody work as a team. Those are words, right? Yeah. But then there's humans. Yes, there are. And so humans don't always do what they should do, what you want them they to do. They do if you select them properly, okay. and if you train them properly, and if you motivate them properly, and if you reward them correctly. Yeah, you do all of that, you're going to get the highest performing team ever. Um, okay, write, somebody write that up and let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> because it, honestly, right. that's the way that right. championships are made. Okay, so I'm out there, I'm in Wichita Falls, and uh, I am now, having heard this, I'm starting to reorganize. I'm selecting better teammates. I'm training them. I'm rewarding them correctly. What else am I doing? Well, you've got to, you've got to say you've got to motivate them. You've got to resource them. Resource you've got to them, give them yes. all the things that they require to be operationally effective. Okay, so now we become operationally uh, more effective. We're more of a team, yeah. and we start uh, competing better. Right. What's next? Okay, you've got to define the mission. You've got to be really specific, really yeah. granular about what that mission means and, and what the parameters are for success. So not to put you on the spot, can you define some military missions? Because I know those ones usually have specific objectives. Go get the bad guy, you know, um, kill them, drag them, the one we need alive, back to 
CENTCOM and interrogate. So give us an example of a military mission and then now that you've been in the business world, uh, an example of a business mission so we can I'll give you draw an, an, the, an, uh, an example, 1980. Um, so you've got the SAS siege uh, of the Iranian embassy. Yeah. So the police had been involved for 14 days. I think it was 14 days, 6 hours and 37 minutes, whatever it was. Then operational control was handed over to the SAS commander on the spot. The place was then cleared within 10 minutes. Yeah, that says a lot of bad things. But what happened is that that wasn't just a 10 minute operation. You know, there were three weeks that we did trials in Pontrilus. You know, we were jumping through windows. There's all sorts of really, really cool stuff. I actually didn't get involved in the actual thing. But the, uh, but the planning stage involves so many more people than, than you saw actually on the day. Now, they knew everything, they knew every room, they knew, it's interestingly that every terrorist was killed but one, and he was the only one that spoke English. Do you think that was a coincidence? No. And that was the one played by Ben Affleck. <laughs> <laughs> coincidence, so, you so, never see. So you got to yes. go in there and you knew, and you got smoke, you got flashbangs, there's, yeah. there's bullets going around, there's all sorts of things like that. But the, there were mission critical parameters. Now, when I was involved, I always made a, a thing. I never lost a single person under my command in 16 years. Now, I made it so that was part of the mission. I said, guys, this is not a suicide mission, right? This is not all about heroism. I'm going to get you back to your families, to your loved ones. And I promise you that. And therefore, I build that into the mission. Because we can always fight another day. You know? yeah. So there are going to be parameters that are mission critical for that success. There are also going to be some areas that you want to safeguard. Okay, so you don't want to be just going in 120% all or nothing. Yeah, that's nuts. You know, you've got to hold something back so that you can either learn from it, replicate it, make it better another time. So but I, I think in hearing you say that, one thing that I, I see people do in the deals I'm in, because it's not life and death like you've described, they're willing to lose people along the way. Yeah, collateral right? damage. Yeah, it's collateral damage. Like, ah, we lost Susan. Eh, Whatever. she get another job. You know, it's not life and death, but at least we got the money. Yeah. Right, and so I do see that mistake happening all the time: is people willing, not not setting as one of the mission objectives, is everybody comes back safely. Yeah. And, and you get a lot of churn and yeah. burn in business yeah. as well, yeah. you know. And and this, I've heard the adage time and time again: you know, some will, some won't. So what? Move on, you know. And and that's all well and good if you're prepared to burn and churn and spend the whole of your life trying to get new customers, trying to get you know, new targets, you know? and, and that's exhausting, exhausting. Wouldn't it be better if you could get in there and make such a powerful statement and actually give value, tremendous value, so that person wants to come back time and time again. And not only do they come back time and time again for their own needs, they bring all their friends. They bring the friends of their friends. So if you do it right, you can actually maximize your success by a factor of 10 because you've got one person. They say six points of separation. You know, If you do it right, you'll get people coming to you and therefore saves on your marketing budget. It saves a lot of time. So give an example of a, bu so of a business mission clearly articulated in, okay. your, in your opinion. Okay, well, in, in the, in the uh, mid-90s, um, there were like four major banks in the UK. Royal Bank of Scotland was just coming in. I think it was about number seven at that point. And they were really interested in my ability to be able to create very high performing teams. So they were in the, in the business, in the banking industry, one of the most highly regulated industries in the world. Uh, there was only so many percentages they could offer that someone yep. else wasn't offering. Them. Yep. Everything was the same. But their people were different. So I said to them, I said, give me your top 20 guns your people from all over the country. Put them under my command, I'll train them, I'll motivate them, and we would then pick a place, an area. And we went in there and recruited and pitched and got farmers and businesses and we decimated the opposition. Within two or three months of doing that, just the other banks, knowing that our team were coming into the area, we, we called them hunter teams. Yeah. And it created such a stir that it demotivated the competition and enhanced us because we knew everyone was the best. Yeah. They went from number seven to number four in, over eight, in under 18 months. That's so kind of like when I drop thing. into my competitors' areas, 
they um, feel em emboldened and start laughing. <laughs> so it's the opposite, but I understand I don't think exactly that's true. what you're saying. But, so th but that's the key, you know, <laughs> and, and we had this in a number of times, just the thought that my team was going into an area of interest, it meant that the terrorists stayed at home because they knew that with the resources, with the intelligence, with the motivation that we had, th they were unlikely to win. And therefore, it was a very, very powerful way of being able to overcome the power of the opposition and embolden yourself at the same time. So you get this feeling at the end of the day that you become invincible and it's not a bullshit invincibility. It's based upon facts. It's based upon experience. It's based upon the truth and the authenticity that what you do counts, what you do matters. You know, and, and that is the power of it, I believe. So, so this is awesome. Um, and this is in the territory that I don't, I care about. I don't talk a lot about, but I'd love to drag you in there if I could is sort of um, when we go out. So for example, when we go out to raise money, it's a 90 to hundred day process, right? So it's 30 days to package the deal. You would call that yep. training and, and going up ropes, down ropes, breaking a room, you know, uh, um, and attacking a fake compound. But we do 30 days of preparation. Then we go to market for 30 days. Then we find an investor or buyer. Yep. And then it takes 30 to 60 days to close. So we might be, you know, 90 to 100 days in a deal. Not every day goes well. And not every military mission and not every, you know, in the business you're in today, not everything goes well. What do you do on those days at the end of the day to, to go, hey, um, we put today out, we had these results, they weren't exactly what we wanted. How do we bridge from the end of today, which wasn't that great, to tomorrow where you know, we want to get back on track and achieve? What's your thought? Well, in Special track? Forces, we had a, a saying, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Yeah. So we would make these great plans. We had models, air conditioning, all this cool stuff, you know, maps all over the, I mean, you knew everything about everything. You get on the ground, it's all changed. Yeah. So then all you've got is what you are, who you are and who your team are. So they're relying on the fact that you're not gonna go, oh shit, yeah. Okay, well let's like get that. specific though, right? So you guys have, have planned to take down an area, you know, you know, Aziz Ben Mohammed El Mohammed is in there and he's doing, uh, um, he's a guy you wanna get, he's doing bad stuff all over the world, you train for it, you go in there, boom, flashbangs go off, the helicopter, everything is going perfect, you get there, he's not there. It's three little old ladies knitting and making uh, uh, noodle soup, right? That's what actually happens in terms of a reset. You get them to make you a great cardigan. All right. <laughs> <laughs> or some socks. All right. All right. Yeah. So, you always yeah. make the best of a bad deal. Right. See, there is always something to be gained from whatever, yeah. you know? I believe that there is no such thing as a failure. There is only the failure to learn. That is, the, that is it. So if you can take anything away from whatever you do, then it's a positive. Everyone looks at it that way. No one gets down. No one puts their head down. Everyone goes, right, well, that one up, didn't we? What can we do better next time to give us an enhanced ability to be able to score the mission next time? So everyone's in the, in the, in the positive sense, and it's not like a bullshit positivity. You know, it's like everyone looks at it in a different way to how I suppose normal people look at it. Normal people get dejected. They're, they're constantly barraged with things they're, to make them feel disempowered, to make them feel that someone else has got something over them. You know, when you're in this warrior mindset, it doesn't matter anymore. Okay, so let's dig deeper, right? I prepare a presentation, I go in and I make it, the, the, the buyer is leaning in, right? Um, the, we hear lots of good signals. We go and make the presentation. A day later, we get an email. We ex excitedly open the email, and it says, hey guys, listen, we've decided to go in a different direction. We really appreciate the time you spent on this. Love what you guys are doing. It's not perfect for us. Thanks for coming in, okay. right? What, what do I do next? Okay, right. if you've built the relationship so that they actually care about you, and, and I would, I'd argue the fact that the fact that they've even said thank you for your time is an email, and they're not just you know, not saying anything, that shows that they care a little bit. So you go back to them and you ask for feedback, and you say, you know what, 
in, in uh, our, our whole way of being is that we like to be the best that we can be to give as maximum service to our clients as possible. In order to be able to help us serve you better, what could you give me by way of feedback to allow me, because obviously there are some areas, we think we're pretty cool, we thought we'd package this really cool, and therefore we haven't served you correctly. So would you please do me the service of telling me what that so, would be. So there isn't a warehouse built yet that can contain my ego. How do I shrink that thing so I can go Never back shrink. to someone? Never right. shrink, okay? How, how what do you I, do is you yeah. morph it, All right. right? People are never gonna give you money if, to a shrinking person, Sure. okay? If you don't have the presence you know, that they feel comfortable with and confident with, they're never gonna give you a dime. But if you have that element of strength, so even if you have to walk away from the deal, you walk away from a, a position of power, you know, you walk away from a position of integrity, you know, it's like, great, okay, we didn't do this one, but we'll be back to you because okay. you obviously so we like go us back, something else. We, we get the feedback, although one thing I caution people is, you know, that feedback is you can't build a Frankenstein business with feedback from lost deals, no. right? So we get that feedback, we feed it into our system where we start to under, you know, get a sense of why things happen in a certain way, but we don't pivot our business because of feedback no, from of course some not. crazy customer that we're not doing No one will respect you so, if you did. Yeah, so, so we get that feedback, we feed it into our artificial intelligence, big data machine, and we start to get a better sense of the world we live in, but we don't take any immediate action. What's next? We just lost a big account, we hope to get it, we got a little bit of feedback, but we want to reassemble the team, get our minds back on a, on a positive tilt and move in with strength for the, the coming accounts. Okay. What's, what's next tactical Well, item? First of all, you've you got to ask yourself, do we really want it? Okay? Because is this attainable? Yeah. If it's not attainable, move on. I mean, really, you know, but if it's attainable, so you look at it from a, like a percentage point of view. So right, we did 60% right. Yeah. Now, most of the time, in fact, no, 60% is actually not a good um, example because 60% is what we call the surety. Um, percentage. So this is why they have 60% um, pass rate in exams. So an examiner needs to know that you didn't just flick a coin, you know, 50-50. When you have 60% pass rate, that's a minimum pass, they at least know you've read the books and done it, okay? Anything else from there is jam on top. So you've got to get across the line of that level of surety. It's a psychological threshold. If they are 60% sure, then they're going to take you to the next level. They're going to want 80%, but they can then help you with that but you've got to get past the 60% first. Okay, so you've got to work on a percentage. What did we do right? What did we do wrong? And you forensically look at all of those things. You empower all the things that you did well. You lock them down. It's like, it's like when you're climbing a mountain. Nice. Piton, bang. I know that I can, right. if I fall back to that point, right. I'm still nice. going to be safe. Nice. Like so, so you, you literally work on all the things you did right. Then you, tr you get from them what you did wrong because you don't know what you did wrong. You did everything that you thought was right. So unless someone tells you what that is, then you're still rumbling around in yeah. the dark. You're going to make the same mistakes again. I, yeah? I love it. I love it. So I used to say to my people, I know you are going to make mistakes. You're human, for God's sake. But what I will say is do not make the same mistake twice. Make a different mistake because you'll learn, but do not make the same mistake twice because that shows you never learned from the first one. Make it a third time, you're sacked because it means you got lack of judgment. Okay? So, so that's what you do. And then you go back, you build a better case, a more compelling argument. You link it to the power that you've got, your, your structure. Yeah? So you've now got foundation of what you did right, foundation of the relationship, and then you build slowly but surely back. You know, you may not be able to do it in the second sitting. You may take three or four goes at it. If it's worth it, you'll take the time. And so will they. If they believe that at the end point, you've got something to offer, yeah. they'll give you that time of day, they'll give you that feedback. So, so, so let's, let's round the corner, and this is the last, for the, given the time I have, the, my, my last major topic. Largely, we want, the interrogation we're doing with customers is what they're willing to pay. Mm -hmm. Right, they're, that's their break point. Uh, so one is, can you draw a parallel in the, in the human intelligence interrogations that you've done and been involved in? Because you want a piece of information, Yeah. right? It's an, but we want a piece of information too. We want to know what price so we can not miss it too far. So, right, so if somebody goes, uh, just as a real example, um, hey, we're willing to invest $10 million in your company. The big question is at what price, right? Yeah. So if it's at, we don't want to shoot too low, 
right, and leave uh, a deal on the table. And we don't want to shoot too high and let them know that we're crazy and unrealistic. So that's our interrogation is, is feeling them out where they're willing to price and then we want to price around there. What, how do we, from your perspective, in these interrogations, start to get people to reveal a little bit about where their pricing is at? So again, uh, an example from human intelligence, if you have one, and then uh, you know, a business example of really interrogating someone to, to get information they do not want to give us. They know, they want us to, to anchor to price first, mm -hmm and they don't want to spit out a price. Yeah, well the fact of them is, is there a, again, it's a psychological threshold that no one's going to reveal all the cards straight up. It doesn't make any sense for them to do that. Most people have a 15% threshold, you know, above or below, you know, when, when you think about it. Um, and you'll be able to very, very quickly, you know, be able to gauge that. Now, the way I would do that is with micro expressions and looking at their breathing. If you always look at the button here, you, you know, you see where the, the, where the breathing goes. You can actually ask questions that actually create that stressor. So already now you're beginning to blush around there, there and there, mm -hmm. because literally all I did was just place my energy there. Your eyes are now beginning to gla glaze over as well. You've got that wateriness because you know I'm hitting the point yeah. and now you're feeling under threat. Yeah. And now you're gonna start to, the more I push, it's like pushing air in a bicycle tube under the water and the bubbles will start to come out. So I know when, you, when you're actually doing your yeses and when your noes. See, your yeses is actually your left thumb. So I'm just looking at you, I haven't diverted from your eyes. But every time you do that, it means yes, and I've got a, I've got a yes signal going. This is why on. I always tell people. You, no. just did, you just did it again. You did it with both thumbs. Oh. That's a double right. thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so right. what I'm actually then doing. Can no. somebody get me away from Simon <laughs> very quickly before I. Because what you did then is soon as soon as you see, and what you did, you, t typical diversion tactic. Yes. Oh, here we go. All you right. bring your foot back. Yeah. You bring your left foot back. Yeah. Diversion. So I now, now know your dance moves. Yeah. So all I've got to do is stay in mind so that I don't give anything away, but ask you quality questions about what your thresholds are. Yeah. Okay, so nice. as soon as I did that, you like that, that's something you're gonna yeah. use. You did yeah. the same thing with the finger again. But this yeah. time, you actually did a micro expression with your right eye. Okay, so when you actually have something that you really like, you go <coughs> like that and give me almost a wink. It's fantastic. So I'm looking for that, I'm scanning yeah. you right now. And now, you know that I am, so now you're probably not gonna lie to me. So I'm gonna start getting more authenticity out of you as we time goes on. I can now start to leverage that. So I'm now starting to play you like an like a, an instrument yeah yeah until at the point where i know that you're so compelled i then ask for the next thing now interesting that as a, as a kid you were probably told i want never gets i disagree i say i want always gets if you ask the right person for the right thing at the right time for the right reason in the right way you're going to get a yes that is the key as soon as you do one of those wrong, you're going to get pushback. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so you see what I do? It, it's, it's actually a very, very powerful process of earning the right, you know, getting attention, earning the right, qualifying who you are, eliciting their, the information that you require, giving them as much information as only they require to get to the next step without overselling, monitor them for micro expressions and stressors, leverage them, empower the good things, reframe the bad things, and then when you're ready, you close it straight off. You do a test close sometimes, but you close it straight off. Be prepared to ask for the money. And that is where most businesses fall over because they believe in their product, but they simply don't ask for the money. You know, if you've made your compelling argument, if you've got your you know, relationship, right? If you know everything about what's going on, why shouldn't you ask for the money? You not asking for the money is outside of your duty of care if you really care about enhancing their life. Be courageous and go for it. So, uh, Simon is a better me than I am a me. <laughs> I would like you just to take over my life and uh, enjoy all... No, this is, this is terrific. I mean, uh, this is hard for the cameras to really pick up the power you know, hopefully the chipsets and the CMOS and the distribution through the internet and the screens and, and, and the bandwidth and everything can replicate the strength of your presence. Um, it's just, it's been terrific. What, it's intense uh, and, and so many things to think about. Um, help me understand a little bit about your life. What are you doing now? What 
you know, well, what, I'm a, right. obviously, as you can imagine, I, um, I'm an international author and yep. speaker. Uh, I've worked out of Australia, out of the UK, and now I'm here. Now I'm here in, the, in the, the US, where my third book, The Order of the Nephilim, is being made into a Hollywood movie. So we're raising money right now so that we can actually make this trilogy. And we've got some great A-listers that are interested in this, done the screenplay. So this is my first venture uh, into the movie business, and that's why. So is this just all a big roundabout way to ask me to star in the leading role of but the But you know it makes sense, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I accept. Excellent, excellent. Um, oh, that, so that's, that's so. So I do that. Um, obviously, I'm still on the speaking uh, network. I, I work with high performance teams. Uh, I do conferences for large companies and basically raise the raise the game and the abilities for companies and teams and salespeople, CEOs, to to be a better them, a better version so, of them. So I'm watching this video out there and I go, I was so interested in working with Oren until I heard Simon <coughs> come along. Screw Oren. How do I get a hold of Simon? They just need to vote with both of us. Okay. I'm, I'm a good team player. How, how do they get a hold of you? Where should they go? What number, email? How do, how do people find you and, and connect to the string? Well, they can Google know? me, Simon Trezellian, T-R-E-S-E-L-Y-A-N, uh, all over the net, all for good reasons, of course. Yeah. Um, my company is called Starfire. So it's Starfire US. And dot com. Uh, we also have Starfire UK, Starfire Australia, and uh, so that's probably the best way. Um, I've got a very a big presence on uh, LinkedIn, uh, on Facebook, you know, a lot of social media, um, which is where I do a lot of my connection. Um, but yeah, we've got a YouTube channel now. We're just about to, me and my other books have been doing well. So we're going to, I'm concentrating on the movie right now but we're open to suggestion on all things. I've got a lot of things in the pipeline. As you can imagine, dealing with high performance people, I get surrounded by excellence. I get surrounded by excellent ideas. Um, and we're, we've got a number of projects in the, in the making at the moment, all from liquid Kevlar combat mitts that can punch through walls and glass to, I mean, just am well, amazing definitely. projects. Definitely, let's do that. Let's do that next time. If you're within the reach of the internet, Google Simon Trezellian and if you're in the movie business and you you know how funding works, you want to see the script and give yeah. definitely get in touch with Simon. He's an amazing guy and I love his stories and and this has been just really fundamentally uh, an improvement on this conversation of how I think about subjects that I think I'm a semi expert in. So this has elevated my game. Awesome. And I appreciate it. Okay. Then my work Great. here is yeah. done. <laughs> it's just begun. So <laughs>